let's drink some water. When I was 12, I wrote my first novel. It was a winding 433 page handwritten affair about an orphan girl and her friends attending a magic D&D school, and the girl ultimately sacrificed herself to defeat evil. It had all the amateur mistakes, from cringy tropes to sagging middle syndrome to characters that made no sense and a complete lack of plot. But it was done. And upon doing that, I decided it was time to actually learn how to write. But the American school system maybe has one unit or one elective dedicated to fiction writing, and usually by stuck-up teachers who won't let you write genre fiction, nor do they have the capacity to create anything longer than a couple of pages. So I began to teach myself. And now I'm a full-time game writer and narrative designer. I think we all have a point in our lives where we fall in love with a new hobby, art, writing, world building, and we bundle into it with a childlike wonder and trip and fall and scrape ourselves. And sometimes we won't even see that we're doing that because it's all so new and exciting. That honeymoon phase of any new love is so important and it's valid to stay there in love uncritically for fun. I love crafts, but I will only ever be an amateur doll maker with no regard for quality. And similarly, you may want to remain an amateur writer who does it without regard for quality as well, only for fun. But if you want to become a professional writer of any kind, a prose author, a game writer, a screenwriter, or at the very least, if you want to take your craft more seriously and you want to work to improve it, then this is the video for you. Whether you've just started your writing journey or whether you have actual publications in one storytelling type and you want to breach another, uh, there is something in this video for you. While I can't promise to teach you everything I have learned, I can tell you how I've learned everything I've learned and then you will have the tools to achieve whatever writerly dreams that you might have. The first thing you have to learn on your self-taught writing journey is that you will be learning from human beings, and humans are flawed. I suppose you could also be learning from a machine learning algorithm like ChatGPT these days, but that's even more flawed. <laughs> you have to evaluate for yourself who you can trust. Who is this person? Why are they telling you this information? What do you gain? What do they gain from communicating it? For example, trope listicles. Uh, on YouTube are either for advocating for more or less of a specific trope in whatever media it's for. Uh, Brandon Sanderson did talks about writing because it was his job at a university. He was paid to do it. Your writer friend may give you writing advice because they want to see you get published. Some people may be giving you mediocre writing advice because they want you to buy their $3,000 writing course to get the good advice. Mm, uh, and it's not... and. Okay, just, I want to point out, it's not necessary to learn from someone who's altruistic, or, and you don't need to be suspicious that everyone is manipulating you or trying to scam you, but it is important to consider why someone is saying something. So, why do I have the right to tell you how to write? It's because I mostly taught myself, and, and also now it's my job. I have a game design degree, and I only have an English minor, but, and, you know, those are accomplishments, but those accomplishments might have been nepotism or something. Um, so maybe what you actually want to do is find some of my writing, read some of it, and see if it's actually any good. I have a whole web novel free on my website, um, and there's also all these YouTube videos that I have that for which I wrote scripts. Um, and even if you don't want to read or watch anything else that I've done to sort of quality check me, um, you should at the very least consider if the advice I'm giving makes sense for your scenario. And this should be true of anyone that you take advice from. Before though, the step before you start taking advice from other people is to figure out why you're doing this. Why do you want to write? Why do you want to tell stories? Stories are such a human thing. We've been using them to communicate information and morals for millennia. I like to say that stories are for practicing emotions, like fluff and escapism is for practicing feeling happy or powerful and safe. Or horror is about feeling uh, different kinds of fear, or how angst and grimdark are for practicing hope and despair, or how stories about people who are different from us is practicing empathy for those situations. Um, the emotions in stories aren't being triggered by experiencing those things. You can shut a book or pause a game anytime that it's too much, unlike real life. And so it's a safe way to practice feeling these big feelings. 
So for me, on a personal level, I use my writing to explore and examine trauma and how wounds can shape people long after they are inflicted. But that's something I could do in my bedroom by myself and a couple of friends. So why did I decide to go pro? And honestly, that's because I can't imagine being happy doing any other job. Like, this is my dream job. And as a game dev specifically, I get to touch all sorts of other parts of games too. The gameplay mechanics, the art briefs, economy systems, world building, programming. I don't just get to write from, I mean, I don't want to just write for the rest of my life. So I don't, so now with this, I can do all sorts of things. I want to bring worlds to life in a way that you can interact with them, immerse yourself in them fully. I want to show you what it's like to be someone else for a little bit. And maybe you'll be kinder and more empathetic, and that will in turn make the world a kinder and more empathetic place. That's my dream. That's my purpose. You don't have to figure all of this out right now. Uh, you don't need a whole philosophy when you're just starting out. It's absolutely just to be valid to just be inspired by the stories that you experience and want to write more like them. Um, but it's good to think about because writing quality is so subjective. So giving yourself this North Star can help uh, you to improve your writing to fill whatever need you're trying to achieve better. All of my advice is, and all the advice that I find most helpful is geared around um, trying to get people to feel certain emotions at particular points in a story, um, but you might not find that that's as relevant to whatever you're writing. On that topic, you should probably figure out, at least in what, uh, shall we say, sphere that you want to write in, um, like who is your audience? Is it just you? Is it you and a few friends? Is it going to be the public? And if it is the public, then who? Because it's not everyone. It's not everyone. Uh, is it young women who want to read fairy erotica? Is it bitter retired teachers from underfunded inner city districts who are sick of the system? Is it interracially adopted Chinese grade school kids who want to learn about their Chinese roots with their white parents? How you tell stories should change depending on who you're telling them to. And uh, because, you know, you're going to make assumptions based off of what they know and what they don't, what is new and what is not. You should also figure out if you want to go pro or commercial, is the goal for your work to be sold for money and in what medium and what compromises are you willing to make to sell it? Because you will have to make some compromises. You should be aware of the risks and downsides of whatever field you want to go pro in. Um, for example, I mean... Listen, I just know a non-zero number of people who thought they wanted to go into the game industry and then realized the reality of it, the crunch, the sexism, the competitiveness of the jobs, the difficulty of the programming and the tools, the accessibility, and it wasn't for them. And they wasted so much time and money trying to get into an industry that they didn't actually want to be in. The film industry has so much nepotism and classism. And it will be hard to break into it as a nobody. So, like, if you were going to do that, are you okay doing corporate commercials and doing copywriting until you get that lucky break to do your creative stuff? Or as another example, I have met so many people who say they hate writing or drawing, they just want things to exist and be done. If you hate the act of making something, you would probably be miserable going pro in it. Uh, so that might not be the field for you. Why would you torture yourself on a day-to-day -day basis to have a once-in-a-blue-moon adrenaline dump of I've finished a thing? Uh, it would make more sense for you to do something else as your job and then commission people to make the things that you want. So make sure if you're going to go pro, research what you're getting into before you dedicate your life to doing that. Make sure you can live with it. So as you can see, being uh, storytelling gets extremely personal very quickly. And if you aren't comfortable being honest with yourself and listening to that honesty, you're going to have to get to that point really fast or you're going to hurt yourself. And hurting yourself is bad. Kindness is good. So, And creatives do their best work when they feel safe. And you cannot escape yourself. So you must be a safe place for yourself. And part of that is honesty. So really do some self-reflection, dig deep, and uh, figure out why you're doing this and what you're willing to tolerate. Okay, the first step to any storytelling is to have ideas. This is where most of us start. This is probably the easiest part, because ideas are shiny and cheap. They require no effort to generate, and because they don't actually exist, they're beautiful and perfect. They are a dream. It's like how if you never confess to your crush, they can't reject you. And, uh, but you will also never be a couple. So if you never refine your ideas and make them reality, then they'll always be perfect. So it takes courage to try to make them and to do the work to make your idea work in reality. However, if they just stay in your head, they'll never exist. So they can't be good. 
Existing is the first and necessary step for them to be good. I've never personally struggled with starting things, so I can't exactly speak to what kind of fears you might feel getting started. So a good idea, so if this is a step you struggle with, find others who also struggle with it and find people who have overcome that blank page and uh, take their advice. But what I do have experiences is organizing your ideas. Now, when I start a new project, if that idea did not come fully formed in my head, which is most of the time, I like to start by just compiling everything I know about the idea with anything that interests me at the time, art that I like, shows I like, songs I like, tropes that interest me, into one document with loose headings that make sense. Um, these headings could be vague, like vague cultural suggestions like French-Irish mafiosos, and then you put all the characters and aesthetic images related to that under there. Or maybe you have songs that are inspiring different aspects of your story, so you group things by songs. Um, for example, when I started my 48 hour, I guess this technically was the 28 or 24 hour novel challenge, but over two days. But anyway, the, so yeah, 24 novel, uh, uh, 24 hour novel challenge. I started with a list of tropes I wanted and then some images from Pinterest. And then I matched them up as they made sense or in ways that were new and exciting. So I had like adoption trauma, orientalism, fantasy political trauma, steampunk settings and industrialization and turning points in history, how fascists use facts as cudgels and not truths to guide our behavior, and pretty pictures of demons and glittery astrology looking people. Um, and then I just started categorizing that. For example, with facts or cudgels and then the fantasy uh, magic system, I decided to base the magic system on words and prayer. And then to, to go with that uh, idea about fascists and fascism. And then uh, steampunk slash industrialization is about destabilizing the norm. Um, and one of the most destabling things historically is when historically marginalized voices suddenly have access to a platform. So um, uh, like in this world, that means that that's magic and that's facts. So maybe magic used to be hard to get, but now everyone has it. So uh, you can kind of see where this is going. I just kind of like pull out those strings and detail it fully. Like how is the power shifting? How do people feel about that? What kind of culture would have existed be before with the ecological pressures in this area combined with the magic system? And how is it different now? Um, and all this leads to the rest of the world building, and then I build the worlds and the care around the character. Sorry, I build worlds around character concepts uh, rather than uh, building a world first and then finding characters in it. So, if I want an orphan turned assassin girl adopted by the mafia, I need a local equivalent of the mafia, and I need to generate circumstances in which mafia like groups would arise. But that's my process. I know a non-zero number of people who start with a world. They start with, how could a world be different if everyone could control the power of the elements? Mm, or something like that. And then they start building countries mm, and fire lizards and gods and languages. And then they don't have a story because they started with too many little stories and uh, they don't know what to do now. Or I know a lot of people that come up with character relationships, like what if a fey lord enslaved a human, but then they fell in love with them, uh, but they don't have a world built around it. And for some of these people, when they get stuck, they're just stuck. They just want to sit until they have a new idea that unsticks them. But in my experience, um, I got to use critical thinking skills when I'm stuck. The ideas will not fix themselves. There's a logical answer to the question, what should the story be? What should the world look like? Now, I have a decent knowledge of world history and geopolitics and stuff. I, I mean, like, it's more than nothing. So I have a place to start that for either analysis or further research. But if you don't, I recommend uh, researching the roots of whatever ideas you have. For example, if you've got dragons, make sure to read dragon myths internationally and learn the historical context in which they were written, uh, because this will lend itself to much richer ideas than if you just read De Rivera's works. Always go to the source. Research is super cool. Uh, but for both these situations, the world building with no story and the vibes, characters, but no plot, I actually recommend developing characters first. But let's put a pin in that and then we will talk about characters. Mm, don't forget to take water breaks. So there is all sorts of advice on how to develop good characters out there with unique voices that both resonate aesthetically and emotionally with other people. I personally recommend anything from film courage on characters, uh, GDC talks on characters in video games, uh, that stands for game designer, your game developer conference or something like that. Um, and then uh, anything, and then Brandon Sanderson's masterclass on writing that he did for free uh, during um, 
uh, the, the 2020. Uh, a lot of people recommend Googling like character questionnaires and filling those out, or creating psychological profiles ma based on the Myers-Briggs personality types or whatever. But I find that actually it's simpler than that. The most important rule about characters is that they should be interesting. They should be interesting people somehow. Um, if the character resonates with you, they will probably resonate with other people too. Uh, and this is, by the way, what people mean, or should mean, when they say write what you know. They mean write authentically. Write your emotional truth. Write in such a way that people believe what you describe. On the most basic level, I need to know a character's appearance, body type, eyes, hair, fashion style. Uh, this gives me a general vibe um, at how other people will perceive them. I need to know their goal and I need to know their motivation. You might think goals and motivations were the same thing like I used to, but they're not. Okay, so this is very important. Listen up. A goal is a concrete, achievable thing. Like, I want to be the king. I want to eat an apple. I want to make a new friend. Goals uh, might change throughout the story, or every goal might have sub-goals to complete it. To become king, you have to raise an army, spread propaganda, marry your rich neighbor, etc. Um, this is important because this is going to drive their actions in the story. A motivation, okay, is like a need. This will drive how they try to achieve their goals and why they're trying to do it. It's closely related to some sort of core wound, uh, some sort of inward false belief about themselves. Um, this motivation might be, I want to be loved, I want to be in control, I, I want to understand myself, I need to not be abandoned. Uh, this part really requires you to understand your character and to probably dig deep into yourself on a personal level. Um, it has to be something that's all kind of unattainable but always chaseable. So really dig into why they feel this way and how their psyche turns this yearning, this aching, into action and personality. Uh, for example, someone might be like, I need to be better than everyone else because if I'm not number one, if I'm not perfect, then people can reject me and leave me. So I have to be the best so no one will leave me. I mean, this is obviously false, but it feels true to this character and they can't escape it. Um, another example in a similar vein is, I am unlovable, I don't want to be rejected, so I won't form any connections at all. And if anyone tries to form a connection with me, I will reject them first, so they can't reject me. Um, so this character, for example, their whole motivation is avoiding rejection, driven by this false belief. The thing is, someone who believes they're unlovable, how do you think they're going to act? They're not going to put any effort into relationships, because what's the point? And on the other hand, a different character who thinks they're unlovable is going to lie to everyone because they th they want they need to feel loved, but they know no one can love the real them. So they're going to be dishonest and charming and flashy and crack jokes and av but avoid vulnerability. And these are two really different characters who both have similar motivations. Um, so you'll just need to think about like how your specific character is reacting to their motivation, uh, and that's how you know like the goals and such come in. Um, now this stuff isn't a easy to just pick up on, and for any of you younger writers, um, this is why some people look down on younger people's writing, um, your writing in particular, and it, this is because they think you don't have a good handle on this stuff yet, on people, on deep emotions. Um, and I know like when I was 12, I didn't have a very good understanding of what heartbreak was like. I didn't realize how it actually feel to sacrifice myself for the world, and I didn't know what it would feel like to lose a close friend because I hadn't lost any, yet I was never that close to anyone at that age. Um, but that's okay. That just means that if you're writing and you're a younger person, you gotta really dig into what make your characters tick, um, at least your most prominent cast members, uh, to make your writing have that authenticity that uh, you might not have yourself just because of your life experience. And it's okay to be young and not necessarily like feel these things yet. You're gonna be fine, you're gonna get there eventually. I know that I always was like, oh, you know, what if my writing isn't good enough yet? It doesn't have to be good enough yet, okay? But that that is something that may be a weakness for you, because I know it certainly was for me. So, obviously, your most well-developed characters should be your protagonists and your antagonists, the heroes and the villains. Uh, there are a lot of different character archetypes and tropes and roles and stories. I think it's a good idea to have a general awareness of tropes and archetypes in your genre and medium, so that might be something to look up. Uh, cliches, too, but cliches are so subjective. Cliches are just overused tropes, but like the things that people think are in the cliché reign, uh, that are cliché, range from, oh, you have a love triangle in your young adult dystopia, how cliché, to, 
oh, you have a protagonist? How cliche. And it's like, mate, character-centric narratives are like all narratives in the last 20 years. Please keep up. <laughs> so anyway, if you aren't aware of the tropes and archetypes in your medium somehow, uh, go look them up. Go experience that genre and medium, take notes on the patterns you see, and figure out why they're there. What function do they serve in these stories? Um, listen to other people analyze stories that you like, or even stories that you hate. Uh, the three-hour documentary, Unfolding Ideas, A Lukewarm Defense of Fifty Shades, taught me more about writing than some of my English classes. I highly recommend it. Uh, this brings us back to the stuck idea people. You can take your pin out now. Uh, for those of you with worlds and no stories, pick someone interesting in your world, someone who is trying to change things and develop their goals and motivations. Uh, for the story vibes people, give those as vibes of people some goals and obstacles, and this kind of development is the first step to giving your story some structure. Um, other great ways of developing characters include interviewing them, role-playing as them, combining multiple personalities of characters you already like, or one of my personal favorites mm, is having characters tell their backstory to me. You know how like when you sit your friend sit with your friend at like a 3 a.m. sleepover and they tell you their life story about their alcoholic mom and the divorce and the time the vole crawled into the hot tub pipes in the winter and exploded when they turned on the hot tub back in the spring, or mm, how they slept in a windowless closet in college and some guy put a tomahawk through the frat horse frat house door it's like that but with your characters what do they think is important what do they gloss over and leave out um but i'm also one of those writers who i like i like feel my characters okay i they uh you know i know it's not true of everyone so honestly you can just make arbitrary decisions about your characters and then realistically propagate those changes forward that's how i design my fantasy maps honestly so i promise it works um also, I want to point out one last thing. Not every character needs to be, like, a real character. Uh, some of them will be props to make the world feel more lived in, and that's fine. For example, the prison guards, the mom calling for you to hurry up and get ready for school, the random shopkeeper, the other train passengers, and this is fine, okay? I mean, in real life, you shouldn't dehumanize people, but these are not real people. Their actions don't need to impact the main plot, but... Make sure that anyone who is, seems aesthetically like they should impact the main plot actually impacts the main plot. For example, love interests and comedic side characters should never be props. They often get relegated to that, but they're not. They should be full-fledged people. Props aren't romantic or sexy, and it's not sad to inevitably kill the comedic side prop. Characters need to be involved in the plot, and they need to do things, and the things that do must impact the plot. Okay, prop characters um, also, by the way, shouldn't exclusively be one race, religion, gender, or sexual orientation unless, um, if you're making something for public consumption, unless you're saying something about one of those categories. And listen, I know that y'all are going to come at me with like, oh, that's too political. But listen, everything is political, even being a good person. So you got to think about what you're saying, even if you're saying it accidentally. Um, but we can talk more about that later. The point is, no matter who your character is, you need to understand them as well as you understand yourself. And, or understand them as well as you understand your best friends and your family. And this means you need to do, know what they do and how this contrasts with what they actually need in their heart. So, understanding the things your characters want to do is going to drive your plot. Now, I want to acknowledge there's a lot of non-Western storytelling traditions that focus more on reacting and surviving a plot that happens to you. And that's wonderful and valid, but I'm not as personally well-versed in that. That requires a lot of skill that I don't have and a lot of education that I don't have. But if you want, please feel free to do your own research on other storytelling traditions. It's a wonderful thing to expand that and to recognize all of them as equally valid ways of telling stories. That being said, all storytelling structures that I've come across basically involve keeping your reader in a flow state, which in psychology is the state that makes hours go by without realizing it because you're in a groove. It is stressful enough to be exciting, but not so stressful that the person experiencing the story has to leave. It's, excuse me, it's about managing tension before you pay it off with a big cathartic release at the end. If you can figure out how to do that, you don't need any other knowledge. Uh, pretty much every author I know has their own terms for every part of the story. What John Ca Campbell may call the belly of the whale, someone else might call the dark moment. Um, what someone might call the turning point, someone else might call a pinch point. Uh, the names are basically irrelevant. Uh, but it can be good to go look up a couple of different storytelling structures, just to name a few to start you off. The Snowflake Method, Save the Cat, The Hero's Journey, Kishoten Ketsu, 
the 3x structure, the 5x structure, the 7x structure, the 9x structure, the Fichtian curve, the plot pyramid. Um, those are some things to look up. Might help you, might not. For me, as a starting place, I find plot is easiest to make interesting when you're making your characters try to achieve things and then fail to achieve things. Uh, this method is called scene sequel, I believe, and it works like this. In the scene, your characters try to do something, a protagonist or multiple protagonists or antagonists, um, and then something stops them. In the sequel, your characters react to the things that happen in the scene, the stakes rise, and then they have to adapt to the rising stakes. And then you just repeat this until the end. Uh, but that's really vague, so let me give you an example from my work. Uh, the scene is, Arlisar just learned that the goddess of chaos is trying to destroy her new home. She decides to go meet with the Sirius of the world to just figure out how to defeat the rising evil. But her father won't let her go because it's illegal for her to be on the streets by herself. And he doesn't think the goddess of chaos is a threat anyway. So she steals his sash, which if he had given it to her would mean she's allowed out, and goes out anyway. But in the sequel, the scene turns out to be on the chaos goddess's side. And so Arlisar doesn't have help. And her father discovers her, theor her thievery and is furious, which further degrades their unstable relationship, and he locks her in his room, and she has an emotional breakdown, and then the goddess of chaos comes in and offers her a deal, the only way to defeat her may to be to play her little game alone. And so in the next scene, she goes about fulfilling her side of this Faustian deal. Um, another way to think about this might be in theater terms, in improv theater terms. Uh, in, improv in improv, the first player makes a choice, and then when you respond, you aren't supposed to just say no because that shuts down the momentum of a scene. You should say instead, yes and or no but, and you can alternate between the two to build an ebb tension. Uh, using our example above, Arlisar would make the choice to go see the Seers for help. And this is a sub-goal, by the way, with the main goal being defeat Chaos Goddess. Um, but then her father says, no, you can't see the Seers but she steals his sash and sneaks out. Then the narrative says, yes, you sneak out and you get to the Cirrus. Arlisar then tries to get the Cirrus to help her and the narrative says, no, she doesn't help you, but the Chaos Goddess offers you a deal instead. So see how that kind of like ebbs and flows between her succeeding and failing? Now, I want to reiterate also that I'm at a point in my uh, stage in my writing journey where I just kind of have an instinct for pacing and I can align my plot points to theoretically get me to the ending I want. And, um... I've never done like a deep dive structural edit on anything that's not a game. Uh, so to be candid, actually, my biggest weakness is actually understanding my characters. I get really stuck on tropes and vibes in the design phase, and then I don't understand them deep enough to know what plot points they will actually hit before they get there. So I like plot out the plot, and then when they get there, it doesn't make sense because I didn't actually understand my characters. So it can feel forced and artificial when I get to these m emotional moments where I work. Um, but I, I also am an outliner or an architect, uh, more than a gardener or a pantser. Those are the same thing. And I have to be. I usually work with other people at a company. They have to know where I'm going. Um, but if you're working by yourself, you can do whatever works for you. Another thing to consider with structure is theme, by the way. I think theme is really misunderstood because high school English teachers make it seem really dull, but it isn't. Theme is basically the big questions and topics of your work. For example, as Overly Sarcastic Productions pointed out, one of the main themes of Arcane by Riot Games is uh, how the bonds of love are unbreakable and why that sucks. And every character and faction in the show uh, loves something and it hurts them. But Arcane is also about the relationships between technology, class divide, time, and family, and highlights this through its parallels and foils and symbols and color schemes and plot, etc. Uh, Lord of the Rings is about the conflict between good and evil, nature and industry, war and healing. Spirited Away is about self-identity and the dangers of construct consumption and greed. And the best thing about theme is you can use them to tie together seemingly unrelated elements of your plot, and that gets you more variety of situations. For example, in Spirited Away, my parents turned into pigs because they ate spirit food and I pulled a bike out of a water spirit. Might seem like unrelated events that don't belong in the same movie, but then you tie them together with the theme of greed. The parents ate the food and then they shouldn't, they shouldn't have, and it polluted their body and they turned into pigs. Or the river was polluted with the bike, so the greedy and the greedy humans made more bikes than they need to consume and then carelessly threw them away, which hurt the spirits. 
Um, and that's a really cool like way to tie together seemingly disparate uh, plot and world building elements. I really like to tie my themes in the world building because world building is a great and subtle way to look at your themes through new lenses. For example, Issei is about what does it mean to be a hero and how do we move past our trauma. So every culture has a hero story that uniquely reflects that culture. The Sphonic story is about a hero who sacrifices themselves for humanity. The Thulian story is about a hero who conquers the North and then dies. The Telethenian story is about the heroic power and limits of rational thinking, etc. Or my video game, Little Burn Maiden, my assassin life sim about murder and self-care, was about how you need to do whatever it takes to take care of yourself, including murder. Obviously not literally, it's a metaphor and a game, and technically no one dies, etc, etc, etc. But with this theme, the story can be about mafia families and murder, but the game clay can also be about feeding yourself yummy food, and playing an instrument for fun, and petting the llamas, and also still murdering people. Now, I, I definitely say you don't need to plan your themes, but analyzing your work through the lens of different themes and understanding the values and big ideas you apart in your work is a useful way of seeing if your work is cohesive and paring down the elements that might not fit it. Oh, Belle, but I don't want to analyze themes still. That's boring and it's not that deep. Okay, if you don't want, if you do not put a message, your own message in your work, other people will find it for you, and sometimes you'll say things you didn't want to say. For example, Detroit Become Human is hypothetically a game about how we should treat all humans equally, even robots. See, in it, uh, a bunch of robots realize they are programs with emotions and they decide to fight for civil rights. They are a metaphor for black people in America. I am not making this up. A black character in the game literally says, my people also used to be hunted and that's why we escaped to Canada. Mm, and then, I mean, not literally, but like, you know, f functionally. And y your robot character is like, oh, that's, I'm like that. Um, the robots are also escaping north to Canada like the black slaves, right? And they sing a, a song that black people wrote about racism in it. it it's, it's definitely about black people, okay? I, they say I have a dream in it, okay? Like it's it's a it's a reference, I promise. Even if David Cage says it isn't, it is, okay? Except the entire metaphor falls apart when you realize the humans, no matter how we look, are more or less the same inside. We are all human. Robots are literally not. And even if you do it, accept it's a metaphor, it's a bad one because a spoiler alert, it turns out the robots programmed to have emotions and revolt so the corporation selling the robots could make more money and if, which yes makes no goddamn sense but ignore that because clearly david cage sure did <laughs> you know why black people wanted civil rights because they deserved them because they were human beings in a country that pretended to be about equality for all and they were not being treated equally not because a corporation manufactured their discontent now, it's very clear that David Cage wanted it to be a genuine pro-civil rights thing. Like, he had the I have a dream thing in it on, like, walls in it, and it's called Become Human, so very clearly we're supposed to be pro-robot and thus pro-black people. But I don't want to dig too deep into this example, but it's you, you can kind of see this is a pretty major failure on of theming. This is why it's important to have a theme and execute upon it in your structure. You don't need to do it when you're first writing, you can find the theme later as your character encounters moral complexity by just existing in the story, and then you can shore up anything you didn't mean to say in the editing phase. Themes are great, you should definitely use them. Now, pretty much everything I have said has largely been medium agnostic. Well-written characters are the same in TV, and in video games, and in plays, and in prose, and in novels, and in comics. However, have you ever heard the saying, the medium is the message? As a game designer, let me promise you that the way you engage with a story can be just as, if not more so, important than the story itself. For example, the game Papers, Please is a video game about corruption and bureaucracy, but instead of making you watch a bunch of different perspectives on pure corrupt bureaucrats, you are a border patrol agent and you have to check papers. If you don't check them right, however, you get penalized monetarily, and you're the sole breadwinner of five people, so you want to check them right. However, then someone doesn't have their papers in order, and their husband is already on the other side, so are you going to send them to be detained? Are you going to take the monetary hit to unite the family? And, uh, or maybe, like, a revolutionary who wants to take down, tear down the border comes to the gate. Are you going to let them through to bomb your corrupt government? Or are you going to protect your immediate co-workers? Uh, these are all choices you have to make in this game. 
Papers, Please also has a short film adaptation, but it hits different because you sit and watch a sad Border Patrol guy. You aren't the Border Patrol guy, it's just different. So think about and study the medium of your choice. Figure out how it is both similar and different from other media. How does a story change from film to novel, from novel to video game, video game to interactive play? What are the strengths and weaknesses of each of these media? I don't have the time and space to, in this video to teach you all about filmmaking and video game design and playwriting all at once, so please go listen to experts in those fields. But to give you some broad examples of things to analyze, I find that short stories are best for showing you inside someone's head at a major turning point in their life. Novels are best for showing you inside someone else's head over a long period of time. Games are best for making you make difficult emotional choices and feel your consequences. Movies are best for audiovisual experiences with curated camera angles. Plays are best for musicals. I don't know, <laughs> I haven't done much playwriting, I just love live musicals. Uh, and comics are best for if you need snap your dialogue and visual with your visual storytelling. But before you go jumping into any of these things and being like, oh my gosh, mm, insert media here sounds so hard and difficult to make, I don't know how to draw a film, program, write a whole novel, slash pick up a single moment for a short story, etc. It's so difficult. Okay, listen, relax. No one is making you tell stories in conventional ways. You don't have to do or learn anything you don't want to do, but that might mean you have to make compromises elsewhere. Honestly, the whole creative process, process like relationships, is about strategic compromise. You cannot do everything perfectly ever. There must be sacrifices somewhere along the line for time or money or skill. Figure out what is important to you about your story idea. What is at its core? What cannot be compromised? And let everything else be fluid. For example, for people who just want a world build, write me a super biased textbook from a scholar in your world, or scraps of a newspaper. Or for people who just want vibes and no plot, just write vignettes from your character interactions and no ignore all the connective tissue. You want to make games? Maybe start a roleplay discord instead of making an MMO. Make a cheap RPG maker game or a visual novel with stock photos and creative common pick crews. Make Skyrim with store-bought assets and books and none of the combat nor animations. Make an animation with dolls instead of hand-drawn animations. Listen, I don't write any of the dialogue for Isaiah grammatically correctly, not because I don't know how, but because the way I write it currently is easier for me. You are not obligated to make something marketable and consumable. And I mean, if you're trying to do this professionally, you will need to learn how to market it and consider audiences other than yourself, but marketing is a separate skill, and also you can't sell it if it isn't done. So you have to get it done first for you and for your ability levels, for your ability to get started, and get it done, you're not obligated to do it right. The media is the message, but you don't have to stick to traditional media. What message do you want to send? And what messages can you send? So, we're getting into line and prose specifically here. Line writing and prose specifically here. We are looking at individual sentences and paragraphs at this point. Now, uh, I want to begin by saying that prose doesn't have rules, technically. You can and should do whatever serves your purpose. Um, if you want to and can accurately mimic the prose of Charles Dickens, do it. If you want to write your entire novel in leet speak, I'm not going to stop you. If that serves the emotion you're trying to achieve, do that. However, my friend recently took a creative writing class and I read some of the other students' work with him and oh boy, some of it was bad. <laughs> I mean, no shade to those people. For real, some of them were there for the easy A, and that's valid. But it wasn't effective writing. And that's what we're going for here today. Effective writing. Now, if I were you, I wouldn't just watch this one vi video and assume you know everything about prose writing. I would listen to lots of different advice videos. There's a lot of stuff you should watch for with in your prose that are ultra beginner mistakes, like having your grammar be actually wrong, or switching between present and past tense mm, unintentionally, or stranding your prepositions, etc. Most of the stuff I weeded out of my writing in high school, but you might be watching this and you might still be in high school. And if that's you, like, yeah, don't get all your info in one place, seek other line writing advice. I also want a disclaimer that I personally don't focus on these elements until I am editing, but you might work differently than me, so I'm going to just tell you now. And also, also, I didn't come up with any of this stuff. I compiled it from a bunch of different writing advice videos, but Shaylin Bishop in particular, they are incredible. Please go check out their channel. Um, but anyway, here are my rules in no particular order for line writing or syntax improvement, or whatever you want to call it. 
Don't describe things that don't need it. This can include big things such as how Lamez by Victor Hugo spends a whole chapter describing the history of the Paris sewers, then to only write, so then Valjean carried Marius through the sewers and left. And that's it. That's the end of the sewers. That's the last time you see them. And to be fair to Mr. Hugo, he was being paid by the word, but oh boy, the book would be undeniably better if he wasn't. Um, this is also down to the little things. Did your feet trip on the sand? Your hands didn't trip on the sand, so you can just say, I tripped on the sand. Or did you look at it with your eyes? You don't need to specify that either. Like, what else are you looking at it with? Uh, cutting out unnecessary descriptions will make your writing more digestible and snappier. It also lets your real author voice shine through instead of weighing it down with these unnecessary extra descriptions. Uh, include in this no filter words in what is a filter word? Uh, it's a word that filters the experience through the eyes of your characters. Filter words include, but are not limited to, see, hear, think, realize, notice, felt, on my skin, in my eyes, in my ears, etc. So don't say, she saw the tree, just describe the god dang tree. She's describing it visually, so clearly she can see it. Uh, you can Saying she saw reminds the reader that the reader is not in fact the one seeing these things. And thus it increases the psychic distance between the uh, character and the reader. Now that being said, it is important for a, char a reader to feel the way a character feels in many cases. And you can do this through word choice instead of filter words like see, think, feel. Um, the, for example, that damn unoiled door clearly conveys anger and resentment while the cozy oaken entrance conveys warmth and possibly nostalgia. Uh, your readers are smart, and they will pick up on this. However, because I do find that filter words create this psychic distance, I actually find that it can be really useful in situations where characters are dissociating, or when a character is straight up lying to a reader. So just, so this isn't to say don't use filter words, it's just to say use them strategically, understand why you're putting them in there. Uh, next, cut ing words, or ing verbs. Uh, don't say, I was walking in the rain, just say, I walked in the rain, or I walk in the rain. Uh, I would say this one's a lot less um, objective than the other one, but I personally find cutting certain ing verbs makes the prose more active and snappy. Like, just compare, I went to kill him, stabbing him five times, and I went to kill him and stabbed him five times. I, I know, okay, this might just be a vibes thing, but I feel like the ED just, it's different, man. Anyway, uh, next, we want to cut adverbs and adjectives, and see instead if we can use a richer noun or verb, especially if they're mod modifying something in an obvious way. Like, screaming loudly, that's bad. Screaming anxiously, that's possibly useful. Hyperventilating, better. Now, I've seen some authors on this platform advocating, stop trying to sound fancy and lyrical, which just sounds like advocating for anti-intellectualism to me. Like, I understand making your writing accessible to a broad audience, and also, like, you know, if, if you're super stressed about your writing when you're starting out, like, don't, obviously, like, get it down before you try to improve it. But one, dictionaries are widely available and easy to access, so you're not making your work mm, a zillion times less accessible just because you used a slightly fancier word. And two, that's like saying cooks should stop trying to make new food and stick to what already works. Like, you know how we got bread? by doing weird stuff to wheat until it, be until it became bread. Like, experiment with your words, learn new things, be curious. This will never not benefit you. And it will spread your curiosity to others, too. Tying to the above tip, use better verbs. In fact, as Shailen Bishop puts it, uh, defamiliarize your verbs. The example they gave was, the sun shone through the window. But that's always what the sun is doing. What if you said, the sun pressed through the window, sang, rammed, skipped through the window? That's unfamiliar and strange and could be emotionally salient if used correctly. But don't abuse this because uh, as much as you, yes, should experiment, you don't need all your verbs to go overboard because that'll feel gimmicky and could be distracting from the thing you're actually trying to say. But experiment with it because you might learn what kind of effect different words could have. Also tied to cutting adverbs, adjectives, and using specific verbs, use specific nouns. Uh, the garden was filled with m green plants, like there are three bajillion plants probably, pick some, and make it emotionally relevant. I mean, I mean within con the constraints of your characters. Um, all of these tips boil down to specificity. Specificity is a word cheap way to build the world and the symbols and themes in your work even more. Why say she picked a flower when she could say she picked a rose or a dahlia or an African violet? Uh, this is free symbolism. 
or in the case of sci-fi or fantasy world, a free world building opportunity. Um, the way you engage with specificity uh, tells us a lot, a lot about the narrator. Uh, she picked an azurite bloom with a gloved hand to avoid the bite of its roots. There you go, there's your free world building. But also, if a narrator or POV character notes rye fields versus fields of grains versus too much damn grass, like that shows their knowledge about the different type of grains in this area, or maybe they specify a 16-hand palomino instead of a caramel horse, and this shows their course knowledge. And it's not getting in the way either, that's not purply or overwrought. Oh, purple prose, by the way, just means you over-describe something with a focus on beautiful language in a way that is inappropriate to the weight of the moment in the story. But using fancy words by itself is not a sin. For example, if you describe the juices of the apple pooled in her mouth like the miasma of sin and longing, then you better be describing the original sin and not some lady eating an apple in her kitchen that is unrelated to the character or the plot. Also, avoid cliches and language like you would in the content of your work. Don't say things like her heart skipped a beat or her eyes bore into her or whatever. I mean, it, it, it's just going to be trite if misused. However, you can also use cliches to make something feel familiar and safe and make readers feel smart for predicting what you're doing. So honestly, the better advice here is not just to avoid cliches, it's to use your cliches with intention. The, for example, the, she held a breath, she let out a breath she didn't realize she was holding. It's like an expected moment in an enemies to lovers romance at this point, honestly. You, you should just include it, it's fine. Uh, okay, I also, okay, I wasn't originally going to do dialogue, but dialogue is so ubiquitous across media, so honestly, I guess I should. The thing is, mm, uh, I've been accused of having all my characters just sound like me, and I don't know if I've ever escaped that, so, uh, anyway, mini lesson time, here we go. Your goal with dialogue is to give characters a way to get what they want. People don't speak unless they're trying to communicate something, so whenever you write dialogue, figure out why that character is saying it. You don't need to analyze literally every second of this, but it, it doesn't need to be complicated. Mm, it could be like they are greeting them because they want them to feel welcome or something. Like, that's, that makes sense. But it's something you need to do when you're relying too heavily or not enough on your dialogue. Uh, each character should have their own unique manner of speaking, in the same way that humans do. Uh, their backstory will strongly impact their word choice. Do they speak eloquently, sharply, with grammatically standard English? expressively, flatly, what curses do they use, if any? How do they use them? What do they call their loved ones? Pick out words, this is called diction by the way, that reflects your character and what they want in that moment of dialogue. Uh, that being said, you don't need to show us literally every possible second of dialogue. H have you noticed how in movies people don't say hello or goodbye on the phone? They just pick up and they're like, I found a body in the Thames. In prose, you can skip pleasantries by saying something like, they greeted each other instead of writing it all out. Now, this kind of goes back to, if it isn't important, don't show it. Uh, you know, for maximum elegance in your story, cut straight to the point. Uh, start late, get out early, as they say. Uh, this is also just good scene advice, too, by the way. It keeps pacing going. Uh, people rarely say exactly what they mean, and failing to do so in fiction leads to more subtle dialogue and with more subtext. Okay, that was a little bit of a confusing sentence, uh, but a really great simple example of this is Leia says to Han in the fifth Star Wars movie, I love you, and he says, I know. Excuse me, he could have just said, I love you too, but the saying I know says that and mm, says that he loves her and also portrays his confidence, which contrasts with the nerve-wracking context of the situation he says it in. Or here's another example from my own work. In this scene, Nessa has just been betrayed and is depressed about that. Zalathiel, her significant other and her inquisition partner, asks if she's okay, but she doesn't want to admit that she was wrong about the person she trusted. So here's an example. The scene could play out like this. Nessa, are you sure you're alright after being betrayed? No, I'm all right. I'm not alright. Talk to me. You'll feel better if you talk, and I care about you a lot. I... well, I am hurting. It feels like my chest is going to burst. I really just want you to do something nice for me to distract me from this situation. Of course, anything for you. Okay, so I know I kind of read it bad, but like, see how robotic and unnatural this sounds? And furthermore, this just doesn't suit their characters. Nessa and Zal are both political climbers and social manipulators. Even if they trust each other, they would never be so upfront. So I wrote it like this. Nessa, are you sure you're alright with everything? Why wouldn't I be? If really, what other outcome was there trying to seduce a thousand-year-old demon child? That doesn't mean you aren't hurt. 
Mm, if I was feeling terribly sad and betrayed, I suppose I would want my very sweet boyfriend to buy me flowers and live eel to make me feel better. Mm, we'll see. See, that wasn't even that subtle, but they're just coy enough that their emotions feel bigger because they can't look them in the eye. They're saying, they aren't saying, oh boy, I'm really hurt. They're pretending they're not hurt because it's, the hurt is too big to look at directly. Lastly, on dialogue, there's this thing where you try to do when we write naturalistic dialogue, and we do it because in real life, uh, that's what we do. Uh, and that is, we say three times the amount of stuff is necessary. I learned this from playwright, but I think it might be relevant to comics and video games and prose too. So let me show you an example. Me. Hey, Emily, I got some oranges. Do you want some? Emily. Why do you get oranges? I hate oranges. You should know that. Me. What the f***? If that's what you think, then I'm taking my oranges and leaving. Wow. Okay, now this is very extreme because it, every line's in three sentences, but you can find these three parts in a lot of dialogue and day-to-day -day conversations. It, the part one, acknowledges the previous situation, part two is the actual meat of the statement, and part three is the lead into the next line. But for maximum, maximum snappiness, you just need the meat, and you can cut the padding. Well, part one and part three. So for your consideration, me, I got you an orange. Emily, you know I hate oranges, right? Me, wow. Uh, see, like, how that was snappier. Uh, now, this isn't necessarily tr true or necessary in every context, but if you look at the dialogue in your work, you might, and it's more naturally written, you'll probably find it everywhere. So if you're going for that snappy, witty banter and you're struggling, you can just cut the fat. That This tip is uh, a good place to make your dialogue more concise. And these are all the major things for which I edit uh, in my prose work, and also some surface-level dialogue stuff. I could probably give advice on how you should experiment with your psychic distance and your POVs, and how to put different emotions into your writing. Um, and I could probably do a whole nother video on language and culture and language and power, but that's probably a different video at another time. <laughs> All right, we are back to talking about any form of writing, not just prose. So, at this point in the process, you have learned how to structure your work in broad strokes, or at least you learned the things to look up for for that, as well as how to write on a line level, and now all you need to do is write the thing. Except, that's really hard. <laughs> so, let's talk about some extreme ways of drafting, and then we'll discuss the middle ground. Firstly, there's the Panzer Planner or Gardener Architect dichotomy. The idea is that some people don't want to plan, they want to plan absolutely nothing because the joy is discovering the story as they write. They write by the seat of their pants, or they plant story seeds and tend to them as they grow into a story, that's the gardener mindset. Whereas other people plan the story out like an architect plans a building and build this exact thing. Uh, Hilary Bell uh, was a hyper planner, she started with a summary of one sentence per chapter, and then she would flesh out each sentence into three sentences, and then those three sentences into a paragraph, and eventually the paragraphs into a chapter. But on the other hand, Shailen Bishop, who I mentioned earlier, says their best work is done when they plant the vibes of the story and build the characters' actions around a central relationship towards certain emotions. Um, and this is to the point sometimes that Shailen can't even parse the cause and effect of different scenes, and has to go back in and edit this in. Now, I personally, as you, as I've mentioned, and as you may have gathered from the fact that I talked about structure in like the first part of this video, I'm largely a planner. But while I plan scenes, and sometimes even the beats of a scene, I kind of let my characters run free in the scene. I don't plan out their dialogue. For example, I just let them talk, and I edit it down to the interesting parts later. Same way someone might record a podcast, for instance. It's really important to find a point on the pantsing planning spectrum that works for you, on the following two axi quality and motivation. If you think you're a pantser but you always get stuck in the middle of your stories because you wrote yourself into a corner, and this is a common mistake so much so that people call it sagging middle syndrome, and you're gonna struggle to finish the story because you lose motivation. Uh, the second the is quality. As Shayla notes in her videos, when she plans stories she loses the layers of richness that come from her growing them organically, but this also makes it take longer. But the length of time it takes doesn't devotimate her, but I, on the other hand, when I write myself, I write myself in a corner if I pants too much, and then my writing takes too long, and then I feel bad. So, on the other hand, over planning my scenes feels oppressive to me, and my characters start acting the way they never would because the plot needs it. And then I have to go edit either the plot or the characters. So if you're completely new to this, I would honestly try out both in various sizes of various stories. If you're planning and working with other people, make sure they're on board with the method you're choosing. I mentioned 
I have to play into my stories because I work at the company, but you might be able to get away with pantsing if you work closely with people who have the same vision as you. Uh, or you may need to find or create a unique structure to generate good, consistent stories, but they might be super unique to you. Um, and then the next thing to consider with drafting is how much do you want to edit as you do your first draft. The method me recommended to most beginners is to just go, to stop scrutinizing each and every one of your choices and just write and don't look back. One of the reasons this is recommended, especially perfectionists, is the motivation is to get it done before you try to perfect it. I really like this method because I trust my future self. And I trust my future self to be a better writer than my past self, so this future self can refine the story better than past self could write it. Uh, there's an even more extreme version of this called zero drafting, where you write the story in a way that might be incomprehensible to other people. You write like just the dialogue with no dialogue tags and incorrect grammar and skip whole chapters with just like an acknowledgement like, and then they fight here and so and so wins. Um, and this is people for stuff people who struggle with momentum in their writing. Like they, once they sit down to start writing, they have to get to the end or else they'll never finish it. On the other hand, these people get discouraged if they know their writing is bad. Um, for them, editing as they go and making the story work as they write their first draft is necessary to even get to the end. There is no right or wrong answer, and your answer might change over time, but just be really honest about how well you're writing and how you feel about your writing as your draft. Now, here are some more things for you to consider. Is it better for you to write the scenes in order, or is it better for you to write all the cool scenes and then plug in the connective tissue later? Is it better for you to write on a schedule, i.e. any every day to maintain momentum, or in bursts of passion and energy? Is it easier to write whenever you want, or do you need things like a 24-hour novel challenge, or NaNoWriMo, National Novel Writing Month, which is November by the way, to get stuff drafted? Is it better for you to draft in a word processor at your desk? Or does writing only work for you if you're in bed with your plushies and you write all your chapters in Discord on your phone? Now this is one again something that requires you to be really honest with yourself because writing is frequently a lonely craft. I know personally, I'm always looking for new writer buddies. So you can't always rely on other people to validate you to keep you going. You have to figure out what makes you feel like you're doing good by your own standards. If you're really uncertain, consider looking up and trying out other writers' writing routines and see if they work for you. And if none of these different routines are working for you, try looking at your medium. As I mentioned, I know too many failed novelists and game designers. If you're a beginner at this and you have plenty of time to build stamina and skill, so think about, is this really the medium you want to work in? Would another be medium be better suited to the energy and passion you have? Do you need to make a 20-hour RPG or a 1,000 word, sorry, a 100,000 word book? Or would you be happier and better suited to making a 1-hour RPG or a series of connected short stories? I primarily have written web fiction because that's the kind of stories I would want, because the kind of, sorry, I personally write web fiction because the kind of stories I would want to tell would not be suited to a novel. The serialization creates certain pacing issues that are a product of the medium. But it would read poorly if you binged binge it like a novel. I have these side story tangents, and sometimes I have related stories in my YouTube videos inspired by like the way video games have main quests and side quests, because that's my professional medium as a game designer. Because it's on a website, you can skip around or read things or read side stories or watch things in a different order, and it doesn't matter. This would suck in a novel. Like, imagine if you're reading Lord of the Rings and suddenly it's like, please go to the webpage to get the tree description. Like, that would suck. So. Really think about the stories you want to tell and how you're telling them, and pick something that actually works for you. Now, let's suppose you complete your first draft. Congratulations! <laughs> That's actually a super big achievement, right? Like, legit, most people don't get this far. And now you have to edit it, <laughs> and that's scary. But, so, where do you even begin? Alright, here's the advice everybody gives. Take a goddamn break. Immediately after you finish it, you will feel all sorts of emotions, whether you love it, you hate it, and you might be wrong. So take a week, a month, six months, put the work down, do something else, work on a different piece, hike the country, I don't care, put it down. If you have opinions about what needs to be changed, you can write those down, but don't change anything yet. Now, when you have a clear head, you can edit. If you want to start large scale, uh, which you do, by the way, you want to start large scale with the structure. There's no point in fixing your individual sentences if you're just going to rewrite the whole chapter. So Fill your plot holes, and make sure your causal chain makes sense. Make your pacing good, make your characters work. Rewrite and delete characters, scenes, plotlines, etc. How do you do that? You want to start by rereading everything, and know where things are working for you and where it isn't. Uh, and if you can't accurately judge your own work, get feedback from other people you trust, people in your target audience, people outside of your target audience, etc. Don't just get feedback from people who will stroke your ego. That might be great for your emotions, but not so great for the quality of your work. Next, when you're certain that the broad strokes aren't going to be changing much, 
Now is the time to go through and get your lines working. This is called line editing. Start with the prose rules I mentioned above, or the dialogue rules, and then differentiate your character voices more so they sound like real different people. Find words or phrases that you overuse. For example, I used the heck out of Smile Gently in the first arc of Isaiah. I spoke to my wizened English mentor and editor at Pacifica Literary Review, Matt Muth, and he said this. The easy explanation is that it's a tick of your writing and you'll have to weed it out through vigilance. I feel like either your characters are just gently smiling at each other like lunatics all the time, which is them in correctly responding to situations they find themselves, or they're smiling gently because you keep putting them in situations where smiling gently is the correct response to the situation you put them in. One is a language problem and the other is a structural problem, and I suspect the latter, but I could easily be wrong. He was not wrong. He was right. It was a structural issue. The correct course of action was to smile gently far too often. That's the kind of fine analytical comb you need to use when you're going through your work. But Belle, I don't know how to do that. That's fine. Then it's time to practice. Practice analyzing other works of fiction, both in your genre and out of it. And then use that kind of thinking in your own work. For example, I learned so much about fiction analysis from the Schnee videos on Arcane. His literary analysis, despite not having a background in it, is absolutely incredible. And it's the kind of thinking I wish that we all saw more of when we were making our works in the first place. I want to end this section about editing and drafting by acknowledging something important. Not everyone's brains works the same. Not everyone has the same energy levels or passion or same for the same kinds of tasks. While you are in the learning phases, and many of these things, and beyond as well, it's so, so important you maximize doing the stuff you find fun. If you don't, you'll probably burn out before you get to the part where you're actually good. I didn't ed edit my world letters for years. Literally years, from like 2010 to 2020. It wasn't until Shaylin Bishop taught me to line edit, not, not personally, with her YouTube videos, um, that I even understood what I should be looking for beyond my gut instinct about what was working and what was not. And so I hated line editing because no one had taught it to me in a way that worked for me. I'm still pretty bad at editing, but I finally don't hate it with my whole body. Uh, and I tell you the story to show you that you have to find what works for you, and I can't help with that exactly. The only thing I can help you with is to urge you to learn from lots of different kinds of people, to experiment with lots of different things. And sometimes you'll have to do something you don't enjoy for the sake of the final thing. But once again, you're not obligated to. You're not obligated to do something in a correct way. You don't have to reject yourself because you don't fit into some weird preconceived mold of what a storyteller is or is not. The only thing you have to recognize is that making that sacrifice here means you're going to have to make up for it in some other way if you're trying to go pro and sell it and or work with other people. But remember, you don't have to do anything that you don't want to. One of the options I mentioned above was getting feedback on your stories from other people. Giving and getting feedback. Feedback can be hard if you aren't in the right mindset of it. What if people don't like my work? What if people think I'm stupid? Uh, so let's start with your mindset. Firstly, in the same way that people should never help you without your consent. They shouldn't touch your wheelchair to move you faster. They shouldn't comment on your weight unless you're asking for advice on how to adjust your weight. You do not have to take feedback from anyone ever. You should absolutely disregard any unsolicited advice or criticism if you want to. Next, once you consent to the feedback, please remember to separate yourself from your work. If someone says that comma isn't in the right place, that doesn't mean you're bad at placing all commas. And even if it does mean you're currently bad at placing commas, it doesn't make you a bad person. There is no moral righteousness in skill. So take all of your critique, take all of the critique of your work as someone trying to help you express yourself in the best po way possible. But secondly, you, must, you might want to consider the demographic of the person giving the critique. My mom is not going to understand your furry AU Attack on Titan fanfic no matter how excellently written you wrote it. She's just not in the target demographic. While it can be really insightful to get feedback from those external to your core audience, they can offer you insights you might not have noticed, it's okay if your work doesn't appeal to everyone. Thirdly, you must understand that people don't always know what they want. This is such a well-known fact in game dev mar and marketing. Um, but people don't know what they want unless they're expert critics or something. Like, for example, there was this racing game in which the executives kept saying, the cars don't feel fast enough, and the devs increased the speed, but the de execs kept saying, no, it's too slow, it's too slow. And then the sound designer came in and made the car noises louder, and they were like, wow, it's so fast now. <laughs> mm. Another example, one of my professors was working on Lotro, uh, sorry, Lord of the Rings Online, uh, like a forest level, and it was supposed to be this scary encounter, so he designed all these scary ambush-related encounters and kept making the level twistier and confusing, and, um, 
more surprising and the exec kept saying oh it's not scary enough it's not scary enough he slept on it and the next day he went in and the executives were like oh my gosh it's so scary now as it turns out it's because the sound guy finally pushed the sound to the level so now he he had not changed anything um we see how these execs knew something was wrong but then they had bad suggestion about how to fix it you might get feedback like this and apparently the answer is to make your sound effects better <laughs> just kidding just kidding just kidding that's not the moral of the story um you have to learn how to differentiate between feedback that will actually help you and feedback that's indicative of a problem but not the solution. Now, sometimes you may get feedback with which you do not agree. Should you change it anyway? My rule is generally no, but if three people, separately and individually, without talking to each other, agree on the same problem, I will be more likely to change it. Um, but you need to find your own threshold on this issue. Uh, lastly, I want to be- I want to talk about a specific kind of feedback. It's feedback on representation. The politics are coming back, so let me just be open about mine. In my ideal world, all people, regardless of race, gender, sexuality, socioeconomic status, and ability, uh, would have access to the basic necessities of life, and would have an equal opportunity at greater success than that. <laughs> Does that make me radical if I just want everyone to be happy and safe? Um, so, in the past, Certain groups have been historically demonized and misrepresented in the media, and the discomfort generated by this media has been used to justify committing atrocities against them. So, as a creator whose works are in the public, I personally believe that accurately representing people from these historically marginalized groups is an important and societal good. And even if it isn't, haven't you seen how much more marketable diverse stuff is? Like, you just make more money. So. Like, like, if you accurately represent multiple types of people, now you just have multiple people who are willing to engage with your work. Um, that's only good for you, and literally, if you're misrepresenting people on purpose, you're now just engaging in willful anti-intellectualism and misinformation. And if you still disagree, if you, I don't know how to convince you that being kind and empathetic for different for people who are different from you is good, actually. So, like, if you think otherwise, if you want people to be unnecessarily biased against certain groups, if you want to include these sorts of biases in your work, then, like, I don't know what to tell you, I guess leave, whatever. Um, but to everyone else, here's my advice on getting feedback about representation. Firstly, having a general familiarity with harmful stereotypes is a good idea. For example, not all black people commit crimes. Not all English-speaking Asians have an extreme accent. Not all blind people are helpless. Not all women are overly emotional wrecks, etc. Not only is perpetuating these ideas harmful to those groups, especially because, like, yes, people know they're false, but what is true then? Um, and it's just bad and lazy writing. Like, do you really want to see another boring Asian character with a funny accent who eats rice and that's like their whole personality? Like, come on, I'm so fucking bored of that, just don't do that. Now you might say, but some black people do commit crimes, some English-speaking Asians do have an accent, some black people need a lot of help to navigate the world, some women do have hormone imbalances. And that's true! So the best way to show you're in writing, you're not writing a stereotype, is to have a more nuanced character, and to have other characters of these sorts of backgrounds break these stereotypes. Have multiple blind characters, have multiple characters of color with a variety of criminal records, have English-speaking proficiencies mm, of different levels, and have people of different genders with hormonal issues. Uh, next, I want to address the people who are saying, but I don't want to make the story about race, sexuality, gender, ableism, etc. And honestly, like, me neither. I don't like writing stories about, like, the Asian American experience as a Chinese American. But if you don't want it to be about that, then you gotta just make your characters realistically diverse so it doesn't draw the weird attention to the fact that there are only one type of people in your story. Like, th that, if you draw, don't draw my attention to the fact that you think one type of person is the default person. Because, like, if that isn't me, that makes you me think you think I'm not a normal person, and now I'm uncomfy, and I don't want to experience the rest of your story. But, like, I'm just informing you of the effect that your writing is going to have. And it, if it's not, if you really don't want your story to be about one of the isms, then you just got to, like, write diversely so you don't make it a big deal. Um, so, let's say now you've accepted you want to include lots of different types of people in your work, and you've done some research into how to do it in a kind and empathetic manner. What now? Well, hiring sensitivity readers when you're able to do it is a really good idea, especially if you can have people um, from the group you're representing uh, read your work and critique your representation. Uh, they'll notice much faster if they're being stereotyped. Um, uh, but what if people think I'm racist or sexist or ableist or whatever? That's an attack on me and myself and my personal character. Yeah, okay. Firstly, I want to just say that, like, actually, it's super valid to feel uncomfortable. Like, I mean, we typically associate these traits, sexism, racism, ableism, with being a bad person, right? So, like, and you don't want to be a bad person. So, like, you don't want to be those things, right? 
I empathize with you 100% on how uncomfortable that is. After this, however, if you've actually hurt someone's feelings, now's a good time to apologize. Uh, remember, though, that no one's objected, uh, obligated to accept apologies. You must be ready to forgive yourself instead. Uh, feeling hopeless and guilty and self-loathing is, like, valid. Yeah, you should feel whatever you're feeling, but that isn't actually going to solve the problem. So the more important thing is to educate yourself more on the topic and ask important questions. Like, is it okay? Okay, it's important for me that the main character's best friend is black, but why? Um, and how do I make sure she's not a stereotype? Or how do I make sure she feels like a real person and isn't being diminished to a servitude role? Or maybe like, I wrote a chronically ill person getting magically cured and people said I was ableist. Why is this ableist? And how can I reframe or rework this so it's reflective of the themes of my work? Without including the part that's making chronically ill people feel bad. Now, all this process being said, once again, you're not obligated to sanitize your work for anyone, and your work doesn't need to be a perfect representation of any one group, because no singular company or creator can fix the misrepresentation issues that an entire society is facing. That's mm, just a hyper-individualist mindset that, like, you can come along and save all X people. Like, that's not how it works. Um, and also, some people will be like, well, if you show a gay couple fighting, that's just perpetuating that being gay doesn't work. Mm, no, it doesn't. Gay people have fights. Gay people have good relationships. Gay people are like straight people in that regard. That's just some low-key purity culture, and this kind of ridiculous infighting is just like the Hayes Code again. It's just stifling creative freedom for the sake of moral perfection. I understand the desire and urge to show off your morals. I feel it. Um, and I feel the same because, especially with how polarizing things it can be this way, um, I don't want to accidentally support a, a group that I don't agree with. I, I'm always nervous that because I take ancient Nor Norse influence on my work, I'll accidentally showcase like some neo-Nazi nonsense. But at the same time, I also know I'm not obligated to perform being a woman, or being bisexual, or being Asian, or being adopted for you, and neither are you obligated to do so. What bell? How do I know the difference between valid criticism and cancel culture? Uh, honestly, that's a question you're gonna have to answer for yourself, because it's a complicated question, and I would encourage you to stay open to learning new things, and to stay empathetic to new situations. Um, and be open to the idea you might have been wrong in the past, and it's genuinely okay to change your mind. It doesn't mean that you're, like, a bad person just because you said one thing wrong in the past or something like that, you know? So forgive yourself and learn to move past those things. Um, or And learn to analyze when, when you want to change and when you don't. And that's okay. Lastly, I want to comment, in my opinion, it is okay to be less concerned with accurate representation in not public works. If you're trying to get better at your writing, but you're not planning on going pro, and you're just showing your stuff to your friends, I think that's fine. In private works for you and your close friends, like, for example, in my home Pathfinder game, I have a culture based on India. Now, I know very little about India, and I would never be able to claim to accurately represent it, but my immediate friends, I don't know I don't hate Indian people, and I know I don't hate Indian people, um, and this Pathfinder game is, sor is serving as a place where I can store new things I'm learning about Indian culture, like the different types of Indian music, and their different music theory, or how various Indian traditional fashion um, has evolved throughout time, and what their architectural styles are, and such. This world's kind of like a mind palace in that regard, and I'm showing it to my friends so that they can learn a little bit more about Indian culture too. But if I were to ever make this setting public, I'd probably just hire an Indian person to write this part of the world, because they would have a unique and in-depth view of it. It would be a much richer and better setting. So, similarly, you can write about all the rice-eating kung fu-knowing honor-bound Asians you want in your personal work away from me, where I don't have to see it. That's fine. All right, so let's imagine you've written, edited, and gotten feedback on your work. You made it as kind and accurate as possible. Now what? Now it's time to go pro. If you want to go pro as an author, there's basically two paths to take, traditional publishing and indie publishing. Uh, they are both equally valid, and they will you will want to do your own research on each method, as well as each step along the way, but here's a general overview of things you'll want to know about. Traditional publishing. First, you will find an agent. An agent is someone who will sell your book for you. They may want to see some edits to you, and what you can do is you can like Google agents who are accepting story submissions like yours and message them very nicely with query letters. This is something you'll usually email to them or submit via an online form somehow, and you will get rejected a lot, and that might suck. But remember, just like with job applications, it's usually not about you and usually about how good someone else was or what the market is doing right now. You really don't have any control over the market, so um, you, I guess you can adjust what you write, but 
writing to the market is rough because then the market changes by the time you've written the thing, so, you know, good luck with that. If you get an agent, however, then the company will assign you, mm, then the agent will hook you up with a publishing company eventually, and then the publishing company will assign you an editor and a cover artist and do marketing for you, but you probably will need to do some marketing for yourself. They will then pay you a chunk of money up front. Well, I mean, maybe. <laughs> it's kind of sketchy, actually. You get this far, it's time to hire a lawyer before you sign anything. Seriously, don't get scammed. Um, then they will publish the book in paperback, and then if it sells over 10,000 copies or something, it might print hardbacks, or perhaps the other way around, I'm actually not sure. And then lastly, if you're one of the top three authors in your genre, you'll maybe get a movie de deal. And eventually, when your book stops selling in three, five, or ten years, they'll just stop printing it. And there is the very broad view of traditional public publishing. Uh, do your own research on each of these steps. Don't quit your day job because you can't afford it, probably. Interesting. Indie publishing. First, you finish your book. Then you edit it as well as you can, and then you hire a professional editor to edit it. And then you make those changes. Uh, next, you need to commission a book formatter and a cover artist to try to make your book sellable. Uh, don't necessarily- I mean, if you want- you could try to do this yourself, but that might be foolish. Uh, a cover artist will know much more about book cover design than you do. <laughs> I promise. Um, to do it- you- If you want to do it yourself, uh, make sure you're not wildly undervaluing the skills of other people, because these are whole other industries on their own. Um, without trying to be gatekeeper also, literally, if you cannot afford these steps, however, um, you maybe don't want to publish in like a fully fancy way. I mean, being an indie author is running your own business, and businesses do have startup costs. Like, you can take a cheaper route, but then you should also not expect it to sell as well. For example, I've decided to put my work on the internet for free because I don't have the money and all to do all the crazy work to convert my webfic into a sellable novel. I mean, it's out there, but it's also free. So I've made no money, but I have been sharing my story more because that's the part I care about. Uh, and then throughout the above steps, you'll probably want to start marketing your book. You will be at the mercy of social media platforms, and so it's time to learn how to do social media marketing or to hire somebody else to market your book for you. Fourth. Learn about book distribution. A lot of authors these days are using Amazon, but you'll have to do your own research to learn about book distribution and book distribution platforms and such. Uh, some authors mail their books by hand because they've got more time than money. Some authors uh, use a distributor that does all the work for them. You have options. And lastly, make sure you understand taxes and stuff, because if you do sell a lot of copies, you're going to be paying taxes as if you're a business. So don't get weird surprised uh, surprised by the weird monetary requirements of running your own business, okay? That's important. Don't let the government come after you. That's a problem. Uh, and lastly, just a roundup of professionalism tips for authors. One, don't talk poorly about other authors' books. Um, you will become very unpopular with your co-creators. Unless an author is literally like committing crimes, I wouldn't pick any fights. Two, don't respond to reviewers. Uh, reviews are for readers and not for authors. Uh, reading and responding to them is really cringe and makes reviewers really uncomfortable. So uh, some, no, some people think that you shouldn't even read reviews at all, but if you read them, just use them to improve your future work. Don't use them to bully yourself. Don't use them to prop up your own ego, because those things aren't healthy. Uh, I personally think it's fine to read reviews uh, for critique and stuff, but you should once again keep in mind that um, reviewers are writing reviews for other readers and not as open letters to you. Uh, in a similar vein, don't use your growing platform to harass people, reviewers, readers, and other authors, whatever. It's just cringe, okay? Some I've seen so many indie authors on TikTok who are like a little unhinged, and uh, yeah, just just be chill, man. Like, don't be a dick. It's really simple. <laughs> Do some research into public relations if you don't know how to do this, and try not to cause problems. Let's talk about professionality as a game dev. Now, as a game dev who studied game dev in college, I have so many more thoughts on what, on, like, stuff that can fit here, especially on how to make scrappy games as a solo dev or small team, also just general game design philosophy and all that stuff, but we'll talk broad professional paths to someone who wants to become a narrative designer and game writer. Firstly, what's the difference? Well, the game industry has no standardized words for these things, we're very young. Sometimes narrative designers just write the dialogue and do no gameplay stuff, and sometimes narrative designers design the gameplay, so you'll either have to- you'll just have to read job listings carefully, or generalize your skills to fit all versions of the roles. This industry is honestly super competitive, so I would just recommend 
Just get good. Get good at both generalization and specialization. How? I don't know. Be a god and have infinite time and energy, I guess. I got so lucky with my job, I honestly don't know how I have it. <laughs> um, so next, you gotta get a job, probably through a normal job application process. A lot of game writers in the industry get their start by doing a little work on the game that they're on, and then slowly taking on more responsibilities. Um, but if you aren't in the game industry at all, honestly, game writing is one of those things you can just kind of start doing by yourself with no help from others. Especially in comparison to something like level design. It's just not that hard to throw together some pick crews and royalty free photos with painter filters slapped on them and make a visual novel on Renpy or Renpy, whatever it's called. Or I've seen some visual novels made in PowerPoint even, like no scripting knowledge needed. Uh, for a little extra effort, bust into RPG Maker. It's one of the, some of the most famous tiny narrative games are in that, like Ib or To the Moon or Witch House or Corpse Party or Wada no Hara and the Great Blue Sea. Just kidding, that one's not famous, but you know, you get the idea. Alternatively, uh, if you're thinking about branching narratives, specifically Twine is super easy to use, but you could also just use links in a Word doc. Lastly, you don't want to bother with presentation at all. You could just write screenplays for hypothetical games or adventures for tabletop RPGs. Game writing and narrative design will inadvertently have a lot of overlap due to the newness of the industry, as I mentioned, so it's very easy to just kind of start building your own portfolio. And all these things could probably be sold for some money on the indie scene. Itch.io, for example, has a very indie-friendly friendly storefront for selling literally anything digitally. Um, and then after you start making things and showing them to people, getting feedback, revising, building a network, expanding your portfolio, someone is eventually going to click with your work and want to work with you on something. You can find communities on Twitter if it's not collapsing at the, by this time, or co-host, or Discord, or YouTube, or whatever. Uh, just keep showcasing your work and looking at other people's work, and eventually you'll make friends, I promise. Um, if you're trying to go AAA, those are the big games like Skyrim, Zelda, Dragon Age, Call of Duty, whatever. Uh, you're eventually gonna have, you're gonna basically have to prove that you can already do the job. Um, but if you're okay working on smaller projects, freelance writing in the indie scene is like really valid. That's all about your connections and getting from contract to contract, and then getting a portfolio of shipped projects to get to that next project. Um, sometimes you're gonna have to be the one to start and finish those projects. Uh, but hey, if you like my presentation style and you want to see what it's like to be an indie creator, I'd love to keep you around. I'm about as scrappy and indie as you can get, despite, like, my, I have a professional job, but this stuff I'm doing here is not connected to that at all. Uh, my creations here all center around Isaya and its story of faded heroes, abyssal slug bunnies, and the little girls bearing the weight of the world. Whether I'm making games or writing or showcasing my world building or giving crash courses on my various creative direct uh, endeavors, I'm always looking to inspire new creatives to pursue their dreams, no matter the medium. Now, let's talk professionality as a film person. I know I can't talk about literally everything in this video. I want to close about talking about film. I can't talk about it as in depth, so you're going to have to do even more research here. According to my friend who was doing stage combat in Hollywood, getting into screenwriting is a lot of nepotism. Uh, I mean, anything in Hollywood is a lot of nepotism, and even when it isn't nepotism, it's a lot of using your connections. Uh, the biggest question in films becomes, do people want to work with you, and has a lot less to do with your skill. So you could go to film school, not necessarily even to learn about film, but to meet other people who want to do film. The school ha will also have rentable equipment, so you aren't spending all your money on camera equipment. Uh, alternatively, you could go the indie route and just start writing and filming with your friends or people in your area, and those kinds of films will have a lot of constraints. But so would films you make in film school, so pick your poison, I guess. Uh, regardless, uh, if you don't just grow a following on the internet, if that's if your goal is to not cater to the whims of the algorithms and stuff, then you'll need to find an agent and or apply to contests and film festivals. Uh, this agent will help you submit scripts to places and maybe someone will eventually buy one for money, which will the money will go to you and your agent and anyone else who's signed up to take money out of that. And then finally, uh, the script will go off and you'll get no input and the director can probably rewrite everything that you've done mm, uh, to make it work. Uh, alternatively, you might get picked up by a studio to write for them on a salary or something. Uh, anyways, getting into film has already seemed super hard to me, but screenplays are fun, so, you know, if you want to do it, go for it. So, how do you get good advice? How do you actually improve, both before and after you get a job? To be honest, this is the sort of thing I struggled with a lot, and it's for a really long time. Many of my writing friends growing up were here just for the love of it, for the self-expression, for the passion, but they weren't here to cull their filter words, or check their character motivations, or even have a coherent plot, and that was fine, and that's lovely for them, but it also meant they weren't necessarily pushing me to go further. Uh, they were just happy I was expressing myself too. 
And even when I got into story selling classes, I frequently saw really basic mistakes like no plot, poor syntax, no thematic cohesion, and passive characters. And to be clear, this wasn't like an experimental literary fiction or non-Western inspired work. This was just a basic mistake that these writers would try to fix later. And it was really only with the help of professors who took their time outside of class to work with me, to read my work, and also constantly Googling blogs and YouTube videos from various writers and filmmakers and narrative designers that I've put myself together to be where I'm at today, at a professional quality, to have this entry-level job I have today. So I guess my biggest hope for you with this video was to give you a step up in the process, to list out all the things you need to learn, even if you don't learn them from me, um, so that you can grow beyond the really ma basic mistakes phase that, uh, like, faster than I did. I, and if you want an extra an eye on your work, by the way, I think you should be able to drop a link. But if not, at the very least, you can share a snippet in the comments, and I'd be happy to take a quick look if you want additional feedback. Finally, I want to remind you not to be afraid of yourself. You should love yourself. Care for yourself at least as well as you care for your best friend, because you're going to put out your best work when you're taking care of yourself. It's important to push yourself past your flaws and become aware of your biases, but that shouldn't be because you hate yourself, that should be because you want to see yourself grow. You deserve to be the best person you can be for yourself. Give yourself the grace to make mistakes, but also be willing to work past them. Remember that nothing has to be perfect ever, but striving for perfection is also a worthwhile endeavor on its own. Now, get out there and go write whatever inspires you the most.